Hello, this is Rob Capucci. I'd like to thank you for joining us for another PT on the Net video interview. Today we're going to be exploring some of the biomechanical considerations related to functional training. And joining us in this conversation is international presenter, published author, physiotherapist, and biomechanics coach, Martin Haynes. Hi. Martin, thank you very much for giving us some of your time and insights. You know, for the past 10 years in the industry, we've heard about functional training. And it's a trend that emerged, and I do say trend, because it has had serious staying power. And as a matter of fact, the evolution of all research and application have expanded it even further. But there are a couple of considerations and definitions that we don't hear very often. And one of them are, what are the biomechanical considerations? And before we even get into that, what is your definition for biomechanics? We talk about biomechanics. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a great question. We tend to refer to the work of uh, Mel Sif and uh, Stuart McGill. Um, and uh, they talk about different types of biomechanics. They talk about extrinsic biomechanics and intrinsic. Well, the extrinsic is um, the, what the biomechanists do. So the guys in the white coats, they're doing the drop tests with the force plate platforms. They're doing all the video analysis and so on. Really important piece of work. That's extrinsic biomechanics. Mm -hmm. Um, intrinsic biomechanics, which is what a biomechanics coach would be interested in, is how the body is stacked up in mechanical terms to enable it to perform those tasks. So there's a clear def d distinction between the two. And what do, you, what do you mean by functional training? Because that seems to be a massive buzzword, mm. but very seldom do we have a succinct, non-ambiguous definition and further, an application for the definition. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there is one definition for it. I think there are two sort of distinct groups. Um, functional, um, the human body to be functional is really how we were intended to be, in one example, two, three million years ago. Um, Hunter-gatherers, um, sitting on our haunches, um, reaching for leaves out of trees, running away from saber-toothed tigers, that kind of stuff. That's how we were intended to um, function uh, all those years ago. Now, more recently, function is sitting in a chair, typing, sitting behind a steering wheel. Um, so there are different types of function, and we need to decide which ones we're trying to prepare the body for. Because if we go into a gym and we're doing functional training, in other words, maybe patterns of movement, um, triplanar work, this kind of stuff, and these guys are not biomechanically prepared for that, then chances are they're going to break. So first of all, we could say that the definition for functional training, if I hear you correctly, is transference, isn't it? Transference? How do you mean? Transference of the environment we're working with in okay, to okay. what we need to do in everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. What we're doing or what we desire to do. Absolutely. Kind of like specific adaptations to impose demands. Yes, yes. There is a train of thought though saying that we actually need to go back to the way we were in originally intended to move before we can be functional for today's life. So let's talk about something that you were alluding to before I cut you off with a, trying to grasp for a definition there. Where do we start and how do we know how that shows up for each individual? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think one of the um, uh, important things is to understand biomechanically how people are working before we start doing functional training. Um, we did a piece of work 15 years ago where we tested over 4,000 people. Um, we used uh, ice kinetic machines, lumbar motion monitors, video analysis and so on to try and understand mechanically how people work. Um, then what we did is we tried to um, look at the injury record of these people to try and put two and two together. It was a retrospective study. So we tried to understand um, the biomechanical problems that they had, the injuries that they had. And we came up with some really interesting patterns. And then we thought, well, wait a minute, most people don't have access to half a million dollars worth of uh, ice kinetic equipment and lumbar motion monitor equipment, so which are the best manual screens to be able to highlight and correlate the highest with the gold standard stuff in the lab? So we did a separate piece of work on that to try and look at the, the highest correlations. And then we did another piece of work to look at the best exercises to manage those problems. Um, and we came up with some really interesting stuff that was actually quite new at the time and actually is still not often talked about. Because the problem that we found, we were doing functional training and functional screening, and obviously there's a lot of different ways of doing it out there, um, and they're all pretty similar, uh, and they all have a great value. Um, but what we found is that there were big holes in it. Um, if you, for example, have got um, a, a, a squat pattern, for example, where you've got three joints, we can argue how many joints, but let's say three joints, ankle, knee, and hip, that are responsible for that movement. Um, if one of those joints is dysfunctional, you could still pass a movement screen. You could still pass a functional screen. 
um, because the other joints can compensate. The body is a master of compensation. It doesn't always compensate, but it can. So you could potentially pass a movement screen, but fail a biomechanical screen. So our position from a biomechanics perspective is to look at each individual joint, each individual system, like the neural system, and make sure that it has the capacity to move and to be functional, and then put it together in a whole functional piece. So we found that we're getting far better results by breaking it down, giving each individual piece the capacity to function, and then the functional stuff work much better. So when we're breaking it down in our environment, the gym, and we don't have access to that type of equipment, based on your findings, what should we be looking for? What is it we might not want to see? And what do we do about it? What is outside our scope of practice? And where can we as fitness professionals implement an exercise-based solution to a problem that we discern? The good news is that most biomechanic, intrinsic biomechanical problems are fixable by exercise. Um, you don't need to uh, um, go to a therapist for uh, work on this type of, this type of uh, problem. So the key areas we need to look at are the biomechanics of the pelvis, um, the biomechanics of the shoulder, the spine, the knees and the feet. And if we can get those in good shape, then everything else seems to fit into place. There are what we call key core pillars. Uh, key biomechanical pillars. Um, the mid thoracic spine and the pelvis are two of them. Uh, infraspinatus on the back of the scaps, the back of the scapulae are another two. They're key points and if those key points are working biomechanically often you minimize the risk of injury in every other environment um, but you need to get those um, key points working properly first. To go through a full biomechanics coaching screen um, is about 20-25 screens um, uh, but actually when you're doing them and you've done them regularly, you can get through those in about 15-20 minutes. So let's take a look at any one of those joints. How do you know when it's not functioning properly? Let's take the pelvis for example. Um, there are uh, probably 15 to 20 different tests you can do to establish whether the pelvis is working properly or not. When we did our work with, um, uh, with the ice kinetic machines, uh, there's a piece of work done by Zevi de Vere, who's the um, professor of uh, biomechanics at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and what he found is that the best way of establishing whether the pelvis is functional or not, um, whether that's functional or biomechanically functional is academic, whether it's functional or not, um, is to get somebody on an ice kinetic machine, get them side-lying, and then concentrically resist abduction of the hip, and then eccentrically at the same speed, 30 degrees per second, resist the eccentric moment. Uh, and if the pelvis is functioning correctly, you'll have the normal concentric eccentric ratios and you'll have a smooth force curve. If it isn't, you'll have an abnormal ratio and you'll have a dip in the force curve. So that was a piece of work that he did. We then replicated that work when we did our 4,000, um, tested 4,000 people uh, and then uh, and, and, and found the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what we did is look at the manual screens that correlated the highest. So Downing sign, um, Patrick Faber sign, which is the four sign, is another name for it, and Gillet's were the top three that correlated the highest with Zevi de Vere's work. Now, when somebody walks into our environment mm -hmm. and they're standing, what, bipedal in a field of gravity, when they go through, let's say, a squat pattern, what's something that might show up that might indicate, do you know what, the lumbar pelvic region is not functioning quite as well as it should be, yeah. and you said that you discovered, you and your colleagues, some key exercises that we can implement, share some of those. Mm, certainly, certainly. The problem with doing something like a squat pattern um, <laughs> is that if you've got a problem with your pelvis, you can't tell from a squat pattern or in fact any other patterns. Um, if you were to fail an overhead squat, for example, there are probably 20 or 30 different things that could cause that. The confusion in the industry is, how do I know which one it is? So A does not necessarily equal B. Not at all. There's no way to take a snapshot and a trainer no, to discern absolutely. something like that and come up with a absolutely. conclusion. Yeah. The body is a master of compensation. And while something like that may pick something up, mm -hmm. and if it does, that's great. Often it doesn't. And that's why we went, 15, 20 years ago, down the biomechanics route to try and fill the gap and to try and fill that hole. So, to give you some examples of, uh, you asked for some exercises. If, for example, the pelvis was dysfunctional, um, to keep it in simple terms, the pelvis should move uh, asymmetrically, one side to the other, as we walk and as we move. What can happen um, is that one side of the pelvis can rot out, rotate abnormally forwards and down, for example, or alternatively upwards and back, and that can cause what's called a functional leg length discrepancy. Mm -hmm. So you could have that, and you could do a squat, for example, 
and you wouldn't really know. Imagine doing a squat with, a, um, uh, with one of your shoes off. You could perform a perfect squat and, and cosmetically it would look great, but you've still got a leg length discrepancy and you've still got potentially a rotated pelvis that's causing it. Is that something we want to be patterning or are we just teaching the body to compensate for biomechanical problems? We're probably doing the latter. So let's deal with the problem and then teach them how to move, if that makes sense. And it makes sense. What are some of the exercises that you've got? Okay, if you've got um, a dysfunctional pelvis, chances are piriformis is going to be in spasm. That's one of the muscles in your hip. And there will be others as well. Um, uh, and we use a piece of research done by uh, Jiri Dorvac, who's the um, uh, chairman and the a neuro, uh, neurosurgeon uh, for the uh, FIFA, um, for the, the World Federation. Uh, and he did a piece of work that, said, that says if you do low-grade endurance muscular contractions, um, that is the best way of releasing muscle spasm. So, uh, uh, for example, if you're trying to hit uh, the muscles of the pelvis one way, you might do that is by crossing the leg in this position into the four sign position uh, and then try and engage the hip rotators by performing a rotation pattern like this. So, but with the ankle here, um, as you press down at the ankle onto the knee, the tendency is for the knee to want to lift. Right. So okay. what you do is you resist that movement in here uh, and so you perform an isometric contraction. And that isometric contraction you work at 20% of your maximum effort for 20 seconds and you try and do that four or five times a day. Uh, and, and the idea is to try and release the spasm. See the problem is that most of us have spasm in our muscles uh, and obviously it depends which muscles and what we do that causes that. Um, and if we go in and start to stretch those muscles, you'll get a temporary quick fix. But actually, it's the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do to a muscle in spasm is stretch it. We need to release the spasm first and then go into the stretch. Why is that the worst thing you can do? Because it, uh, it's like a reflex mechanism. Once you've, had, once you've got spasm, you stretch it out, you feel temporarily better, and then it goes into tighter spasm to try and protect it in case that were to happen again. Um, so uh, uh, if, you, if, you do the, if you do the whole stretching thing, um, while the muscle's in spasm, it's a quick fix. You do the anti-spasm stuff first, then you would rescreen them to make sure that it's made a difference. If it's made a difference, you know that muscle was in spasm, uh, and you know you don't need to stretch it in terms of how you um, are preparing the muscle for exercise, for example. Would you talk to us a little bit about why 20% of maximum voluntary contraction? What's the scientific question? Yeah, that's something that is uh, escaping the scientists at the moment. Uh, they've found out exactly what you need to do, uh, but they haven't yet come up with a pathomechanical reason as to why, the, why that's the case. There's all sorts of different theories out there, but nobody's actually nailed it yet. But what they have done is demonstrated that it's that low-grade contraction is the best way of releasing muscle spasm. If you have therapy skills as well to do some deep massage, fantastic. It complements that beautifully. So for those personal trainers that have that dual qualification, um, to do the soft tissue work complements the muscle release exercise as well. And where can we get more information on some of the things that you're talking about with us now? Well, at the moment, the only place that you can get this information is our website, uh, intelligenttrainingsystems.com. Uh, on there, we've got information about courses that we run to teach people this work, uh, and also a, a load of articles and, and research papers and so on that, that talk about this process uh, and how evidence-based it is. Okay, repeat that website for us one more time. It's uh, www.intelligenttrainingsystems.com. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. And thank you.